just said it sounds like there's a bit of a double whammy happening here. You've got an in increase in the price of the food itself. You've got additional investment in the cost of um, IT or digital equipment. So um, there's going to be a definite impact on the, to, to the consumer. So um, we'll, we'll come back to that. We'll circle back round on to how that's affecting. Um, Liam, Liam, you've got your hands up. You wanted to add something to this. Uh, only very quickly. I, I, I think John raises a really good point about the digitisation thing. And half the problem with this is a cultural thing. And I, I'm going to fall on the sword here at universities. We teach people in MBAs to do things in a certain way and act in a certain manner, which is creating this anti-competitive behaviour. And then we ask companies to share data. And what's a one tier one supplier to one person is a tier three supplier. Then there are tier three supplier to someone else. We have this mishmash of different people. And until we get over this this cultural divide and the ability to share data, only then will we meet John's point about being able to lower and gain efficiencies. And then the world will be fixed and we can go home and have a nice coffee or something. Yeah, and, 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 and good luck with that. If I may, Sam, just to, just to build on, on what Liam said, and I'll finish on this point, the, the fact that we didn't have the technology in place that many would have expected us to have led to this impression or this illusion that we had food security issues. We never had food security issues in any country. What we had was a food uncertainty issue. And the food uncertainty issue was driven by the fact that we didn't have our systems in place. And, and more importantly, we didn't have interoperable systems. So we had the food, we just didn't know where it was. Uh, that's interesting. And I'm, I'm going to jump to Carla, because Carla, you, you, you're in a, a, a part of the world and an organization that uh, is very strong on trying to mitigate food supply issues uh, to the extent that you know there's, there's you know, several months of security supply etc would you agree with what uh, john has just said definitely definitely I, I fully agree with what, you, what john has said there has never been an issue of uh, food security or food supply but the data actually the, the issue we have always with the data so for <coughs> i know uh, there is some small uh, food supplier have been driven out of the market because they don't have the reach or they don't have the information or data on where to get and how to uh, access the supply market. But for us, you know, being in the market for a long time, uh, actually we are uh, almost the biggest uh, edible oil packer in the world and the second in sugar. So we know how to get uh, these things. But as, uh, as John said, there has never been an issue of uh, security of supply, but it's just that I fully agree with you. Excellent. And if I may pivot over to Louise. Um, Louise, what's your, what's your take on this? What's what's changed perhaps over, over the last 12 months, or if anything has changed at all, because we're in the same uh, kind of landscape at the moment, we're still in the, in the midst of a pandemic. I think um, the major change for consumers has been a reduction in choice. But one of the ways in which we've kept supply chains running is to reduce the number of stock keeping units and retailers. Uh, the purchase, as John was saying, when you actually go online, if many people shielding in the UK, that suddenly became the first time they'd ever been online. Uh, many of the older people said to me, but I couldn't get what I wanted. There was only one kind of everything. So um, although they learned some of the skills, um, the amount of choice has dropped dramatically. And it'd be interesting to see how that changes going forward, whether some of the retailers quite like to have been in a position um, and have seen cost savings from reducing the uh, how many different kinds of eggs you can buy in one go. Um, and I think um, that also has a whole range of issues for some of those small suppliers that were those premium or extra choices because suddenly they may find that they no longer have a market. What has been interesting, though, is that many of them have pivoted, and we've seen, we talk about pivoting, but we've seen some businesses pivot in a way you wouldn't have believed imaginable to find new markets, new ways um, of um, getting access direct to consumer because they were supplying wholesalers and their market disappeared overnight. So I think we've seen some great agility with some businesses. And I think one thing we've got to look at is why. Why were some businesses tremendously agile? And that's not only some of the small businesses that suddenly started box schemes 
um, many of whom, if they had a shop, then they were in uh, an online shop, they were in a much better position. Uh, but also some of those big businesses that have changed their model. And some of those businesses I'm talking to now go, well, we've now got two totally successful models that are different. How do we go forward? Do we maintain both of those different models? Do we just stop the one that we've pivoted to? And I think there's some really interesting debate that we can have about what we've learned over the last 12 months, which I think will support a whole range of businesses. I think that's interesting in, in terms of, you know, what we've learned, the education around it, how people have pivoted or how organisations have pivoted or how countries have pivoted. And I don't know if I go to you, Marion, in terms of where you are in the world. Um, is this a kind of open market pivot or has the government been able to have an intervention in, in how some of these supply chains uh, play out? Uh, just to add some, uh, some words about what uh, Louise just said. Um, so in, in, in our case, Fine Foods is supplying to Horeca uh, market uh, all the ingredients. And what happened is that in, uh, in the UAE, we had a lockdown around mid-March um, 2020. Uh, and having all the hotels um, closed unless there were some people being stuck in, in the country, restaurants being closed, so suddenly we didn't have any market, almost no market. So we really pivoted and started uh, in a matter of a few days to launch um, an e-commerce platform for uh, the B2C. So it's just a new um, a new business for us that was developed in other countries of Fancy Fine Foods afterwards, and we started this really um, new business, which was B2C, that we didn't know at all, because we were supplying big quantity uh, to big customers, and suddenly we had to do small quantity and uh, delivery to all Dubai and Abu Dhabi. So we had to really um, uh, be agile and, and, uh, uh, and find new businesses to, to continue working, otherwise we would have shut down the, the business. Uh, and then coming back to you, uh, uh, Sam, uh, so what happened is that uh, at that time, suddenly, um, the Air Force shut down. So we were bringing lots of perishable goods uh, from abroad, uh, several times per week from Europe mainly, and no flights anymore. So um, Emirates has been very uh, fast in, in giving a response by uh, putting in place um, cargo flights. So the cargo flights were actually passenger flights, which were flying empty um, to, um, to Europe, uh, and then coming back with only perishable. So the government said, you can only put perishable and medical supplies. So perishables being the priority. So um, Emirates Cargo, which was a small business of Emirates compared to the passengers, suddenly became the major business. Even up to now, it's the major source of revenue of, uh, of Emirates. So, um, we had priority over every other products, uh, perishables and, and uh, medical, but of course the impact on the cost was huge because uh, when you have a flight leaving empty with no passengers, no cargo, no nothing, and coming back only with cargo, with limited space because they were not cargo flights, but they were passenger flights with limited space, of course uh, the price that you pay is it, it, very, very high. Um, so the different businesses have absorbed this um, extra cost, so the, the, the individual didn't feel that much the, uh, uh, the price increase. Uh, but coming back to what the panelists have said is that we thought that we're going to get out and it's going to go back to normal, but what we are observing is that the commodity prices are going up even more now. And, uh, and just a few days ago, Emirates has announced a new uh, fuel surcharge on, on the cargo. So it's not finished. It's, um, it's not the end of uh, this price increase impact. And, and, and we're just crossing fingers that it will get better, especially for Expo coming up. Uh, we hope that uh, things will get better because um, it, it's quite difficult at the moment. Thanks, Marab, and that, that's, a, that's a good plug at the end there for the, the World Expo that's happening in Dubai in a, in a few months, in October. Uh, so uh, hopefully we'll see everyone flipping over to Dubai in, yeah. for, for, for the Expo that's coming up in a, in a few months. But I think you're following the theme here um, that all the other panelists have said so far, e-commerce, um, you know, price increasing, and who's going to absorb that cost. So I think we're, we're all on the same page here. And I wonder if, if that's the same uh, down under if I go to this, because um, 
you know, Mariam did mention the grounding of many air fleets innovation and and, and you're in a, a particularly particularly um, special part of the world. H how's it happening there? Yes, well, in the, in, yes, I am in a very special part of the world, if I may say so myself. Um, yeah, so we've um, f faced um, uh, same but different um, issues. Um, I, I, I can't agree uh, more with the rest of the, the, the panellists, and I, 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 I feel a bit um, oh, overwhelmed by, by having to follow all these wonderful um, insights that have been provided. Um, we... Um, so where do I start? So uh, digitisation and digital technology absolutely um, has has uh, popped the top in terms of um, agri-food supply chains in Australia since um, the, the advent of COVID. Um, but just to add to the, the thinking on this, um, one of the one of the issues that I've noticed um, in terms of traceability and provenance and digitisation and sharing of data is that excuse me, our food supply chains, we've actually um, started to, to put them to the test. Um, we've, a, we've actually, you know, in, in terms of um, looking at the promises that we're making um, about provenance and traceability, we've actually stopped and thought, you know, this is um, um, going back to the point on reliability of our systems. We've actually stopped and thought, oh, can we actually deliver on these promises that we're making um, a, a, about the safety and sustainability and security of the food that Australia um, exports. And of course, we are, in terms of food, a predominantly, a vastly predominantly export nation, export orientated nation. Um, and so we've seen a lot of um, testing and pressure testing um, of the systems that we've got. Um, to go to Le the point that Liam made, um, we have, in terms of business processes, uh, we have. We have seen a, a, a lot of awakening to this um, to this idea of uh, this, this sort of fantastic idea of collaboration um, that has eluded so many of our um, food, agri food supply chain players um, up until quite recently. Um, the idea of not necessarily um, acknowledging what your consumers want, but your what your customers want. So really, really taking a close look in terms of business systems at not only, and not forgetting, obviously, what your customers want, but, um, sorry, about what your consumers want, because we've been very, very, very market-focused and market-driven um, in Australia in terms of our food production systems. Um, but we, we haven't really taken a good hard look at what, um, what our customers are demanding um, and working very closely with our customers to understand what they want um, from along each step of the supply chain. Um, without, without going on um, too much, um, one of the points that I wanted to make that we have, that the Australian agri-food system has um, suffered from terribly and the source of our increases in food prices has been our shortage of labour. Uh, because the borders have closed, we haven't been able to enjoy the um, the, the influx of um, um, English backpackers. Um, everyone in the UK, <laughs> our food system relies on you to, uh, uh, relies on student backpackers um, terribly, and, and also um, uh, people. Um, migrants from New Zealand as well, uh, because we haven't been able to have access to them because our borders have been closed, um, we haven't been able to get the um, uh, you know, fruit pickers, vegetable pickers, we haven't been able to get um, people to drive our tractors, um, and that is where the sources of um, price increases have come, and unfortunately it pains me to say the advent of food waste as well, because we haven't been able to harvest um, the wonderful fresh fruit and vegetables that we enjoy in Australia simply because we haven't been able to get boots on the ground to do it. Um, uh, the, uh, the, sorry, the, the, the last point I'd like to add is, um, is to go to, to follow on from Merriman's point of view is um, the, the, the concept of um, logistics in our supply chain. Um, Australia is an island nation. Um, we Our fresh fruit and vegetables and our meat has relied um, in the recent past exclusively on air freight and with uh, with so many um, fleets air fleets grounded we've our supply chains have really had to rethink and um, our, our transport mechanisms um, the Australian government has been extremely helpful um, in coordinating collaboration um, between tra 
transport um, service providers and 3PLs uh, to, to keep that flow going. But we've, we've seen a renaissance in um, the popularity of maritime transport and innovations about how we actually can use the time at sea to possibly even value add. So instead of hanging meat in a freezer um, in an abattoir for you know several week, days or weeks, why don't we why don't we put the cold storage uh, facilities on the on the vessel um, and let the meat age at sea rather than um, in uh, 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 in a meat processing facility? So these are the type of innovations that um, we've been thinking about, which we probably should have been thinking about earlier. But it's funny how um, a crisis makes us uh, think a little bit harder. Crisis always brings long innovations. Thanks for that. Liz. That's uh, very interesting. And uh, going over to Puri, I wonder if uh, yourself and other Brits are losing out on this back these backpacking gigs over in uh, Liz, Liz's part of the world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you're not. But but tell tell me, Puri, there's. It's, 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 uh, you know, it's the new normal. I think a lot of people talk about the new normal. And I think last time we had this webinar, which was, as we say, more than a year ago, we were talking, we were using words such as, as we come out of this pandemic and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I think we were very, very premature. Um, but I'm sure there have been lessons learned along the way. Um, and in terms of what you tell people in your, you know, in your role as an advisor, um, clearly our perceptions on how we approach food supply chains, the methods, the practices or the best practices have changed significantly. Um, what would be your take on that? What, what's changed and what, 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 do you, what would you be saying differently um, in the future to people? Yeah, so uh, just, uh, I mean, I think the first quarter or first uh, four or five months of 2021 has been pretty similar to 2020. So I think in that sense, we are following the same the trend. But uh, what has changed, I mean, uh, my colleagues here have mentioned most, I mean, uh, really, really uh, valid points and uh, relevant points. But I think one point that we need to emphasize is the skills that we need now to be able to be resilient and to cope with this change. We were talking last time around when we were talking about the new normal. Uh, so I want to mention the latest uh, SIPS Hayes report on the skills that are required uh, for uh, for employers who are working in procurement and supply chain and it is uh, has been emphasized that uh, we, we need people who are able to change adapt to change work from home as John mentioned so uh, working with new technology so in my industry right in uh, academia and uh, higher education it was a massive learning curve for both the students and uh, academics to learn and cope, to work uh, remotely, teach remotely, learn remotely. That was a massive change. Being able to communicate is something uh, that is really important, I think, uh, uh, and we need to be able to work in this type of soft skills uh, so that we can, uh, we can uh, be able to uh, communicate with our suppliers. We say that we, have, we, are, uh, we are passing uh, cost to the suppliers, but we need to also be able to create that relationship between the suppliers and customers and make the cost transparent so that the customers don't feel that, okay, uh, they are have they are suppliers are having great margins. So if, it, if, if we create that sort of uh, relationship, I think that would be something uh, that can help or uh, can boost further. And uh, what I can see, I mean, in terms of my experience, going back to the previous question that the panel were discussing, was uh, we are seeing that uh, uh, omni-channel is becoming a, a trend now. So most retailers are moving toward omni-channel. So previously, some of them might have had a presence, an online presence that was not connected uh, with with uh, with, with uh, the, uh, uh, and customers would have expect, uh, received different experiences if they bought through website or through telephone or something like that. But uh, currently, this ha this is bringing more focus uh, to or or organizations, retailers, that, uh, to look at omnichannel. And uh, looking, and this requires a skill set, so uh, developing new skill sets, bringing uh, the hiring talents. Uh, so Liam mentioned a really interesting point that we are uh, educating uh, future 
procurement and supply chain or logisticians uh, in, in universities, but we, we, we need to uh, show them this sort of uh, skills. Uh, uh, ad adapt adaptability as well is something that we need to maybe uh, include in our, in our teachings. Uh, uh, and I think uh, uh, slowly and gradually we are going to get ahead and uh, we have seen lots of innovative uh, in, uh, solutions. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, curbside picking uh, uh, deliveries, or we have seen uh, organizations that they haven't had any online presence working out, working now with with uh, new uh, with with, with, uh, with new startups to so that they can get closer to their uh, to their customer base and uh, and uh, yeah, I think. Uh, th thanks, Van, for that. That's interesting, and I think um, um, you know it's, it's sometimes easy because we, we, we're in the pandemic. We actually don't know uh, when or how soon we're going to come out of it. And the, there can be a tendency to, to look back and, and do the whole lessons learned thing. Uh, and I wonder, going to John, um, are we in a position to be a bit proactive at this point, even at this point in the pandemic, and say, right, these are the emerging trends, or this is what we should start looking at? Uh, rather, than, uh, you know, from an innovative point of view, rather than always looking back and saying, "Okay, this has happened, and this is how we're going to react." Do you have any views on on, on that kind of ecosystem, John? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I was just going to build on on what uh, Korea sure, go ahead. with with regard to uh, education and skills, and and this fits perfectly in with your question. Anyway, we're we're missing the old scale of systems thinking. If we have to build resilience in our supply chains. We have actually have to stop talking about supply chain. We have to start talking and thinking about supply ecosystems. And, and I'll give you an argument here on that. If you, and we can argue this on both sides validly, if you look at the ever given issue with, uh, in the Suez Canal, that wasn't a physical supply chain issue, that was a services issue. A service failed. Somebody had to get on that ship and steer it through this ecosystem that's well known and well managed and something failed there. Nothing got to do with the physical product itself, right? If we look at some of the, uh, the services component that are critical to get a product to the market, that, that you know, the, the logistics of getting that ship through the Suez Canal is a service. Work that was done at APEC five years ago, that's Asia Pacific Economic Collaboration for those, there's 21 economies that are part of that, that touch the, the Pacific. About five years ago, they looked at the services component in supply chains, and just to bring wine to market, wine to market in Chile, they identified 70 different services that are needed. Now, when you when you look at all of the different projects they did across across uh, APEC in automotive, in other elements of food, the companies were shocked. They go, "Oh my God, I didn't realize that." So, if one of those services failed, the product would not get to the market. So when you break that down, this is why we need systems thinking, because we need to think more in ecosystems, supply ecosystems, and then understand where the vulnerabilities are in our supply chains. And this is critically important. So what happened now during the pandemic, it has forced us into thinking about this. Who thinks, who, who is, who's naturally trained in systems thinking? Emergency uh, services, the military, police. I, I was uh, a member of two of those uh, in the past. So, you know, hire, a, hire a, an ex-military person or an ex-police person or someone that's trained in that, but we need to start adding uh, systems thinking into our curriculum to think more broadly and differently. And, and, and I'll give one example before I finish. If you look at what happened in the US with hogs, with pigs, right? There was a delay in the, in the supply chain in the middle because the processing plants had closed down so they're closed down for 14 days. So the farmers, the hog farmers, have to have to feed the animals every day, right? And the animal accu accumulates one to two pounds every every few days. At the end of that 14 days, the, the physical size of the hog was too big to fit into the pen in the in the processing plant. So all of these things we could simulate in our in our thinking, but we need systems thinking in our curriculum. I think that, I think that's
that's a great example. And, uh, you know, sometimes we try and innovate, but we try and innovate on the wrong things um, because you can't anticipate what problems are going to come ahead. <laughs> and that, and that, that's a great example of that. Um, what, what, what's your view on that, Khalid? Yeah, actually, just uh, what John said actually reminded me of one thing, that it is, it is really, it's, it's not in the supply chain, it is, it's about the, uh, the ecosystem, and it's also about the subsystems that support this. I mean, you know, for most of our food, we are depending on livestock, we are depending on plants, and all of these, you know, have subsystems that are surfacing them, like uh, uh, she was talking about uh, the availability of the uh, students who were coming to pick uh, the fruits. So there's a lot of intricate subsystems that we have really to, to, to think about it when we are talking about the supply chain. It is not just uh, uh, a normal supply chain like any other industry. Actually, you know, one of my biggest challenges actually during last year was not on dealing with what I used to deal with. It was the, the biggest challenge actually was dealing with what I have never seen before. I have been in situations that although I have been in procurement for 32 or 33 years, I have never been in, in such situations. That's a long time. And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and, and you know, uh, the, the, to face a situation that you have never faced in this long time is really weird. That's it. I, is, is that the definition of a black swan event? I know at the start of uh, at the start of the pandemic, everyone was using that term, but uh, I'm not going to go there. In the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to go to the questions that we have got uh, from the audience, and uh, we'll start on one from um, Eva, and, uh, and I'll probably put this to to uh, Professor Louise. And the question is: uh, sustainability and resilience can be contradictory concepts. How do you see COVID? Uh, and the adaptation to it in food supply chains impact sustainability efforts on, in the short and the long run. Thank you. Um, I think th the whole concept of redundancy is something that we're going to have to think about going forward, whether that's in national food security plans, uh, whether that's infrastructure that is within countries that may only ever be used in emergency situations. Um, and uh, who manages that, who develops that, um, but also in our own businesses. We're driving for sustainability, but one of the biggest challenges to getting there is food loss. Um, food loss um, prior to uh, retail or the consumer, and then um, food waste in the home. And I think we have some opportunities to address both um, resilience and um, to address resource efficiency. But going back to what several people have said, one particular aspect of resilience is mindset. And one of the challenges we have going forward is the kind of thinking we have. Um, we've talked about system thinking, we've talked about addressing issues that we've never seen before. And both with how we address issues such as net zero, how we reduce waste in our food supply chains, how we address um, resilience and shocks we might never expect. Um, and what we've also seen in supply chains over the last 12 months is the impact of pests around the world, whether that's locusts, whether that's plagues of mice, and a whole range of other really significant factors, both for local communities but also globally. Uh, we are going to have to deal with all of these factors um, on a much more regular basis. Um, is there a difference between sustainability and resilience? Are they the same thing? Um, if a business in your a supplier in your supply chain um, is replaceable, you can still be sustainable. Um, however, are there certain um, are there certain um, products that you need to know that? you can source because your business will stop. Before COVID, we had issues in Europe with CO2, for example. For many businesses, they'd never thought that the pinch point in their supply chain was how much carbon dioxide they had. I think many businesses had, were more resilient in the UK because they had stopped part of for Brexit. So they had gone 
through a thought process of what are those key materials that we need that if we have a problem with supply, we've got them. So I think in the UK specifically, we have a number of factors that are making us look at the national level and also at the business level of resilience and also how we can demonstrate sustainability. So, so the UK was pretty much prepared, but uh, not, not by practice, but by design almost because of, because of Brexit to a certain extent, I, I, think, I think you're leading to. Uh, what I think is that um, the UK specifically is facing a whole range of supply chain shocks. Some of them um, are um, politically driven, some of them are driven by problems around the world. Um, the, the desperate situation in India at the moment, which on a human level is uh, beyond words. When we then think of all those third, second tier, third tier, fourth tier suppliers that are in India, there will be an impact um, on supply chains because of what's happening. Um, as Liz said, there aren't many, um, there aren't many British um, agricultural students getting on a plane and going to Australia. I can tell you they are waiting. The minute they can come, they will be there. So, and you can rest assured they will be on those planes. Uh, some of my own family included, I'm sure. Um, but... Um, uh, welcome, Louise. <laughs> yes, I'll tell them, I'll tell them. Um, but um, I think the whole aspect of, I think the, w the word supply chain, as John was saying, almost has to disappear. They're supply networks, and it's, about, it's not just about the ingredients, it's about services as well. And so what it is to be in procurement possibly may change as we go forward, when we think about the role of procurement across a whole range of aspects of support for our businesses in this country. I think there's going to be so many things that, that are going to change, and I think you made a very good point. And uh, g going over to you, Liam, very quickly, um, uh, I'm going to stick with the questions, and you can probably come back with something else, Liam. Um, uh, and the question we have here, or a question we have here, is how can we um, support or help poorer countries, uh, especially in this time where, uh, how can we help them develop their supply chains, especially when they're faced with this double whammy, a decreased choice and increase in food prices. How can we support them? Yeah, yeah. How, how can we support them in developing their supply chains? Well, I think it comes back to, to the analogy of the vaccine, because if you look at this as a local issue, then you're going to end up with a global problem. So if you have our supply chains are very extended, there's a piece of analysis not too long ago, so we've got like 1,500 miles and 30 suppliers across the average food supply chain. So these do reach into the poorer countries. I think what's happened with this pandemic is it's just exposed us to some of the challenges that need support in these countries in terms of investment to ensure that we have greater resilience. I know that um, Louise was just talking about India there and some of the challenges. It's not just the food industry. This is going to have ramifications in the finance industry. So we've had lots of outsourcing that's moved into India we sort of pushed it to someone else and said, okay, this is now your problem. And now you've got things that are happening over there, the infrastructure is folding, and that's creating a global issue. So we need to start thinking of this as a global citizenship rather than this local or parochial thing. And that's driven by, I hear lots of words about get rid of supply chain and get rid of this. But what's happened is we, this globalization has, these problems have always been there. It's just a, high, a, a higher version of the flu has just exposed how inefficient we are and how we've just thrown money at a problem. Right now we're scrambling around, I think John called it lessons learned. So I think we need to sort of take a step back at this globalization and say, if we can't go global with this, we still need to be global in order to do this, but we need to be global in a collaborative sense. If I know what that looks like, Sam, in terms of the silver bullet solution, I will become a billionaire overnight. Well, I was going to ask you that, and uh, but, but you, you swerved that, so I'll throw it straight over to Puria. Uh, <laughs> yes. So you, you, you can answer that question. I hope. I, I wish I, could, I knew the answer. So I was just going to quote Donald Trump when he said the known unknowns uh, during the, uh, the Iraq invasion. So that's that's something that we supply chains, uh, people who, I mean, in all over the industries, they, they knew that there might be some problems, but they might have overlooked it or thought that it might be something simpler. They, they have it, they didn't envisage that this 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 I mean so all the supply chains will be paralyzed. 
But again, uh, that this COVID, uh, although it's a sad uh, thing for humanity and all over the world, but it was a wake-up call, a nudge that has helped us to think of priorities, challenges, thinking more critically, systems thinking, as John said, uh, and then uh, not, I mean, uh, being able to react uh, and, uh, I mean, distancing us from slogans and being more practical and, and uh, working together in order to overcome uh, this uh, from this type of challenges. No, I think that, that's a good point. I can see Liz nodding, so uh, I think you got something to. Did you have something to, to add to that? Oh, I, I was actually um, nodding in agreement. Um, I th we've had so we've had so many interesting insights um, from so many people. I'm, I'm not sure that I've got anything to add um, at. at um, at this point, but where, where do we move from here, Liz? I think that, that that's the point. So I think think we are where we are. How, how we is there a situation where we're all more prepared uh, for whatever happens next, or uh, within this current situation, or for the next kind of whatever it's going to be, pandemic, uh, locusts, or whatever? <laughs> are, are we going to be more resilient than this, or are we going to be? Are there enough lessons learned? Do you think? Well, I think um, you know organisations like uh, like SIPS plays a, an enormous role in this uh, because this is got the ne the next steps are really going to test our learning. Um, one of the things that I, I was just uh, reflecting back to our, our webinar of twelve or thirteen months ago, and I remember one of the things that I was thinking were you know, our, our changes in behaviour are they going to stick? Are they going to stick or are we going to revert to type when this is all over? Um, I, I, I still don't know, but I, re, I do remember thinking, you know, how, how much are we going to learn? Um, and, are, and now are we going to learn from, are we actually going to learn from our lessons and actually take a step back and, um, uh, and take stock of what we've done right and what we've done wrong, um, not only in terms of, um, you know, but, uh, uh, policy changes, investment changes, um, business relationship changes, um, demand for labour changes. Um, but what what have we actually learned from the from from the individual point of view, the household point of view, but also the business point of view, and right to the supply chain and even national point of view. Sorry, supply network um, point of view. Um, so and I, and again, I think um, organisations like SIPS um, and universities have a, a, a huge role to play with this um, in this because um, we we're the organizations that, that that teach about learning and reflection and and lessons learned so I think it's 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 up to us to really take a leadership role um, in in taking stock and teaching people about you know reflective practice and and, and learning and, and learning from not only failures but uh, wins as well because we actually have heard a lot of good news stories as well as bad news stories. I think you're definitely, definitely coining that new phrase as well. I can see this supply network thing um, catching on. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back to John in a second. But